يا أهل الجنة إن ربكم تبارك وتعالى يستزيركم فحي على زيارته. My beloved brothers and sisters, first and foremost, I just want to take a moment out to thank the administration of the masjid for hosting me in this wonderfully built masjid. As I was driving in to Ilford, I thought to myself, it's as if I am in Bangladesh, uh, in a Muslim country, honestly, seeing so many niqabis, hijabis, jilbabis, brothers with thobes, walking around. So I felt extremely good. As we drove into the car park of the masjid, I felt even better. Seeing the masjid the way it is, wallahi, it really brings a lot of joy to one's heart. And now I see all of these glowing faces, all of these shabab who could have easily been doing all sorts of evil things on this day. It's a Saturday, right? What are most of the shabab doing? They're either watching the Premier League or they are up to no good Saturday night getting ready to cause all sorts of evil, right? So may Allah Azza wa bless every single one of you guys for taking up the time to benefit, to acquire some understanding of the religion. My brothers and my sisters, our lecture today, may Allah Azza wa keep us all sincere, is about the effects of sins. Have you ever felt extremely miserable and down and you try to find answers as to why you may feel so spiritually empty? Has there ever been a time, brothers and sisters, where you try to pick up the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you try to read the Quran. However, it seemed as if there was a barrier between you and tasting the sweetness of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Has there been times when you felt that all of the doors have been closed around you? Every time you want to get up on your two feet to accomplish something, the door seems shut on your face. Has there ever been a time, my beloved brothers and sisters, where you have been struck with so many financial difficulties, every single time when you try to get up on your two feet to better your financial position, again you felt as if there was no way out of the situation that you're in. ظُلُمَاتٌ بَعْضُهَا فَوْقَ بَعْضٌ Darkness above darkness. إِذَا أَخْرَجَ يَدَهُ لَمْ يَكَدْ يَرَاهَا You take out your hand, it is as if you can't see it. That's because of how dark it is. My brothers and my sisters, there are many reasons as to why we may feel a certain way. As to why we may feel with what I mentioned. The sins that at times we may take so lightly have some serious consequences. Many people think that when you sin, you will only be held to account when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. The reality of the matter is, my brothers and my sisters, this is far from it. The sins have some serious consequences that will come back to haunt us, especially when we think that we can deceive Allah Azza wa Jal. It is just one night that I will disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. My brothers and my sisters, and that which is even worse than that, is when we take these sins so lightly, not realizing that it could be the first spark to one shooting out of the religion. And yes, I'm not the one who said this. In fact, it was mentioned over 700 years ago by the great Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi. When he said, the sin that one carries out, it is the first spark to disbelief. 
to one apostate in front of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَمَا أَنَّ الْقُبْلَةَ بَرِيدُ الزِّنَا أو بَرِيدُ الْجِمَعَ Should I say, just as the kiss is the first part to sexual intercourse, وَكَمَا أَنَّ الْغِنَا بَرِيدُ الزِّنَا And just as the music that one listens to is the first part to a zina. Brothers and sisters, the sins are not a light matter that we might sometimes, brothers and sisters, look down on. إِنَّكُمْ لَتَعْمَلُونَ أَعْمَالًا هِيَ أَدَقُّ فِي أَعْيُنِكُمْ مِنَ الشَّعْرِ وَكُنَّا نَعُدُّهَا مِنَ الْمُوبِقَاتِ As the great companion Abu Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentioned, Indeed, you carry out sins that you see, subhanallah, smaller, or should I say maybe more thinner than a piece of hair. And we used to count it or see it as the most destructive sins. Today that which we take very minor, the major sins that might happen in our communities, because we've become so desensitized to it, this, my brothers and my sisters, would be considered by the companions as something that is a no-go. It can't happen, never. Let alone the minor sins that we've perhaps seen as a normal part of life. These minor sins they used to see as the major sins. Look how times have changed. May Allah Azza wa protect us. So I have, brothers and sisters, a number of the effects of sins written down here that I took from this kitab called Adda'u wa dawa The sickness and the cure. Wallahi, when you read the muqaddimah, the introduction, it breaks your heart. Because it was a letter that was sent to Ibn Qayyim of one saying, if I continue like this, then indeed I will run myself in the destruction. I remember when Shaykh Abdul Zaq al-Badr was teaching us this kitab, he was saying that this is a kitab, it is a book that is so relevant for those in today's day and age, especially those who have become addicted to sins. Because the questioner, the one who sent this risala, this message to Ibn al-Qayyim it was very evident that he was addicted to some sin. However, it wasn't made clear exactly what the sin was. But it was some sort of addiction that you could take away from the Muqaddimah. So the Shaykh Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, he wrote a whole book that has also been translated into English, which I advise every single one of you guys, inshallah ta'ala, to look for. It's called The Sickness and the Cure by Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi. The first consequence, brothers and sisters, of the sins that we carry out. Brothers and sisters, from the most common questions that I receive, especially in the month of Ramadan, is the month of Quran, right? Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fi al-Quran. The month of Ramadan in which the Quran came down. We all want to open the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. We want to hit the ground running. We want to better ourselves so that we become better Muslims outside the month of Ramadan. We want to use Ramadan as a stepping stone. And is there a better place to be starting than the Quran? You open the Quran in this blessed month when the shayateen have been locked up and the doors of Jannah have been swung open and the doors of hellfire have been slammed shut. You open the Quran, you sit there for a couple of minutes and it just doesn't seem to be penetrating an individual's heart. You can't sit there holding the Quran. You close it and then you come back maybe 20 minutes later. You open the Quran, it doesn't seem to be happening. It seems like our hearts have become sealed. We struggle to have that connection with the Quran, that connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. Why brothers and sisters, Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, he says from the consequences of sins, is that one is deprived of knowledge. 
Have you guys heard of an Imam al-Shafi'i and also an Imam Malik? Two out of the four great Imams of Fiqh. The first of them is the great Imam, Al-Imam Al-A'zam Fi Zamani, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullahi Alayhi. And then you have Al-Imam Malik, and then the one who came after, Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i, and then Al-Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal. Two of them, Imam Al-Shafi'i and also Imam Malik, they came together. And at the time, Imam Al-Shafi'i was a student. He sat down in front of the great Imam, the Imam of Al Medina, Malik ibn Anas rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatan wasi'ah. Imam Malik was absolutely amazed at how sharp the memorization of an Imam al Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi. And he said to him the following Inni ara anna Allah qad alqa fi qalbika nura. I can see that Allah Azza wa Jal has placed a nur, a light in your heart. Do not extinguish this light with the darkness of sinning. Subhanallah. As time went on, they say the memorization of Imam Shafi'i became affected. He started suffering from some memory loss. His memorization was so sharp. Imagine you have a kitab, right? He would have to cover one side just so it doesn't get mixed with the other side. Photographic memory. Allahu Akbar. So his memory became affected. You know what the reason was? They say because he saw the ankles of a woman. So it was ankles on the ankle and he looked at it. And that affected his memory. I remember before I was leaving Al Yemen. One brother said to me, listen, Muhammad, because he knew I memorized the Quran. He said, Muhammad, I advise you not to go back to the UK. I said, why? He goes, you may look at a woman and you will end up forgetting the whole Quran. Well, I looked at the brother and I thought, is he being serious? As time went on, I began to realize exactly what he meant. Imam Shafi'i's memory became affected because he looked at some bangles on a woman's ankles. Now you live in this sexualized society where women are objectified. Just about every banner and every billboard you have, a half naked woman. That is being used as a marketing tool to sell a product. That's what it's come to, brothers and sisters. If only our sisters knew exactly what society is trying to do to her. They are there to strip you of your clothing, to objectify you, while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored you as a woman. And everything that is precious when you think about it, it is so hard to get to. Agreed? Who in his right mind walks around the streets of East London flashing his bank card or the money that he has stored in a safe. The diamonds and the pearls, it's very hard to get to. And now women are precious. So it's hard to get to them. They are covered just like all of these other precious materialistic things. Anyways, brothers and sisters, he saw the ankles of a woman that had bangles and it affected his memory. And then he mentioned these very famous lines of poetry when he said, Shakautu ila waki'in suwa hibdi farshadani ila tarki al maasi fa akhbarni bi anna al ilma nurun wa nurullahi la yudali asi. I complained to waki' about my bad memory loss. For a very long time I thought, why did he go to waki'? Who's this individual called waki' ibn al jarrah? He could have gone to Imam Malik, he could have gone to so and so, and that individual, but he went to Waqi'ah. I'll tell you guys why after. I complained to Waqi'ah about my bad memory loss. He advised me to leave off sinning. Out of all of the advices that he could have given him, he told him, leave off sins. Farshadani la tirk al Allahu Akbar. He didn't say to me, Imam Shafi'i, the glory days are behind you. You've memorized. You're bound to forget at old age. 
لا فأخبرني بأن العلم نور ونور الله لا يهدى لعاصي He told me that this ilm is a noor, it is a light. And this light is not given to a sinner. As time went on, after studying this kitab, brothers and sisters, I was reading Sir Alam al-Nubala and I came across what was so amazing about Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah. And it will make sense as to why he went to him. Ali ibn Khashram, he mentions, ما رأيت بيد وكيع كتاب قط. I never ever saw وكيع holding a book. Never. إنما هو الحب. Everything was from the top of his memory. So I asked him, ما دواء نسيان. What is the cause of forgetting or memory loss? He said, if I was to tell you, you're going to act upon it. He said, إيه والله. He said. ترك المعاصي to leave of sinning ما جربت مثله قط I've never tried anything like it the sins brothers and sisters it deprives us of being able to taste the pleasure of the Quran to be able to sit down and to recite Wallahi the sins that we carry out it prevents us right they could have made a lot of excuses for themselves However, they were self-critical, which we will come into, inshallah ta'ala, in a moment. Even Ibn Qudam, rahmatullahi alayhi, he says the following. مِن مَوَانِعِ فَهْمِ الْقُرْآنِ وَالتَّلَدُّذِ بِهِ From the causes as to why one may be deprived of being able to understand the Qur'an. And tasting the sweetness of it, three things. Number one, أَنْ يَكُونَ مُصِرًا عَلَى ذَمْ he is someone who persists on the sins that he does. Everybody makes mistakes. Here he's speaking about persisting on it. He got away with it. There were no consequences. And sometimes that happens, right? There were no consequences. So, khalas, I got away with it. I wasn't struck with any difficulty or any hardship or any financial problems. Let me try it again. Hmm? Number two, أن يكون مبتلم بالكبر. To be tested with arrogance. This is a huge factor as to how an individual may be prevented from being able to taste the sweetness of the Quran. And it may make sense as to why we struggle to open the Book of Allah Azza wa Jal. It may well do, brothers and sisters. Even Shaykh Hussain Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi fi kitabi al-rad al shadri he says, رَأَيْتُ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْمُنْتَسِبِينَ إِلَى الْعِلْمِ يُبْتَلَوْنَ بِالْكِبْرِ I saw many, many of those who ascribe themselves to knowledge. He's not just talking about the average Joe that you see walking around the streets of East London. لا. He's talking about people of knowledge are tested with arrogance. وَيُحْرَمُونَ حَقِيقَةَ الْعِلْمِ They are then deprived of the essence of knowledge. You've been studying or you've been upon a certain way for maybe 10 years. Or you were brought up from a young age doing something that is in contrary to the Sharia. You've become old, white beard. You have a little bit, someone comes and corrects you. Who are you to come and correct me? That's the kind of response that comes out of your mouth. I knew what the sunnah was before you knew what a sandwich was. Wallahi, I heard this with my own ears by one of the pioneers of the da'wah when I was in Al-Yemen through audio. You want to tell me what the sunnah is? I knew about the sunnah before you knew what a sandwich was. I've heard statements such as, I used to clean your backside, now you want to teach me how to make wudu? All of this, brothers, is kibir. It's arrogance. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, arrogance is batarul haq wa ghamtun nas. To belittle the people and to reject the truth. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? We really have to empty the vessel, this heart, 
needs to be cleaned. Otherwise, we will be deprived of that which is going to grant us salvation. And I think it's important that I touch on this statement of Ibn al Jawzi. A lot of time we talk about ilm, ilm, what's so good about ilm? Many people think that you only seek knowledge if you want to become a sheikh, if you want to become a serious student of knowledge. La wallah. Brothers and sisters, pay attention to this very important point. Would you agree? Would you agree? That because of a lack of knowledge, there is that which is inflammatory, considered by the texts. I'm not here, by the way, brothers and sisters, to express my own views and opinions. I'm just quoting. There is immoral sexual practices that has become normalized in the society. The world has become a very colorful place. You want to cross the road, the zebra crossing is rainbow colors. It's become a very colorful world, right? We've become so desensitized to what is unacceptable morally as per the script. And by the way, brothers and sisters, this isn't, this isn't only a Muslim position. The Jews believe the exact same thing. And the Christians, I believe it's 230 Jewish rabbis, they call themselves the Torah Jews. And mental health experts and doctors, they came together to take a unified position against the colorful team. Saying how this is what harmful and immoral. Does that make sense? But then us Muslims, we feel extremely embarrassed and shy to speak about what is in the Quran. Come on, brothers. We are either made to feel that we have to have coalitions with them or we must be on the back foot. The point I wanted to make is, likewise, how to be a man. How to be what? A man. Toxic masculinity. Huh? Alpha male. Madriyash. People are taking guidance from an individual who half the time spews absolute filth and evil. The feminists have had a strong hold on society for a very long time. And now the opposite has emerged. Shabab are glued to these individuals, either the feminists or what? Now this new movement. Is it in line with the Sharia? Wallah, a lot of it isn't. Point I want to make my brothers and my sisters. Al-ilm teaches us how to navigate and maneuver around fitna to shubuhat wa fitna to shahwat. The fitna of sexual temptations and desires. Ilm teaches you that. Put your hand up if you came to my lecture yesterday in Edmonton Islamic Center. Tayyip, Jamil, let me ask you guys a question. When the wife of Al Aziz locked Yusuf in the room and she said, Let's go. What did he do? He saw refuge from Allah Azza wa Jalla. And then, did he just sit there? What did he start doing? He ran away from her. He ran away from her, right? Is this not the end? How to deal with some of these sexual temptations? Today, a sister slides into your DM, right? And then the shaitan whispers, I'm going to give her da'wah. She ends up giving him da'wah. Her looks end up giving him da'wah. Because of you entertaining that which you should have run far away from. And there's so much more that can be learned, brothers and sisters. So much more. Does that make sense? About how to deal with the day-to-day -day struggles and challenges. Likewise, Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam, when Jibreel came to her in the form of a human being, did she just sit around entertaining this man who just approached her? I seek refuge in Allah from you. 
If you are someone of taqwa taqiyan, stay away from me. That's the response. She never got excited. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of attention. <laughs> Teaches us a lot. So the ilm enables us to maneuver and navigate around these temptations. And most importantly also, brothers and sisters, fitna to shubuhat. The fitna of doubts. We are taking our kids and our brothers and sisters to these universities and these schools which are breeding grounds for kufr, shirk, and all sorts of evil. Agreed? And even more so so, they are being fed a lot of colorful things. And then when the child comes home asking questions, we get angry. Or we say that she has or he has a jinn. No, he doesn't have a jinn. He just doesn't know. He wasn't taught how to tackle a lot of that which he's facing. And now, he has every right to ask, ask questions. Brothers and sisters, ilm is not just to become an alim, a scholar. It will help you immensely in dealing with a lot of your problems. Has anyone here watched a lecture on my YouTube channel called Filthy Fathers? Cheating husbands and free mixing? Put your hand up if you have. Alhamdulillah. So I can ask you a question now. If we sit here and we speak about why you shouldn't gender mix, people say, oh, here we come again. Haram police. Right? Backward minded. Out of touch with reality. What do you mean don't gender mix? We are in the 21st century. I mentioned hadith and verses, but what I also did, I mentioned first-hand accounts of people who fell victim to gender mixing. A woman would open the door, come with your husbands and let's all sit around and have tea. What happens? And by the way, I took all of these accounts from Islam Q&A. Because they emailed in, sharing some of their personal experiences of how they fell victim to the gender mixing. Wallahi, some husbands were cheating on their wives and they are in the same house. Because of these gender mixing and probably the woman that's writing this email, she's writing a while, she's what? Crying her eyes out. I remember I said something when I was going through these different accounts. It's times like that when I really appreciate knowledge. Because the Sharia ah tells us how to save our relationships. All of these people who are emailing in, they're talking about how their relationship broke down. I lost the love of my life, my husband. I lost him because I innocently opened my house for people to come in. Can you see how ilm comes in extremely handy? Or not being alone with the opposite gender. Never does a man seclude himself with a woman except that the third is shaytan. Wallah, I don't care if you're a sheikh. I don't care if you're Sheikh Salih al Fawzan. Or one of the great scholars of our time. If you think that you can control yourself when you're alone with her, then I think you're alien. You're not a human species. As men, that's our biggest fitna. To be honest here, guys, Ata ibn Abi Rabah, who used to limp, puck nose, could barely see properly, right? And he was paralyzed. He never had a wife. You know what he said? If you make me the chancellor of the city, I will take the job in charge of the wealth. But if you ask me to be in charge or to look after Amatun Shoha, an ugly slave, then I wouldn't do so. I don't feel comfortable. I fear for myself. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? This is ilm, teaching us how to have a way of life that will protect us from a lot of heartbreak, a lot of problems, a lot of struggles, a lot of difficulties that we experience when living life. So going back to the point that I mentioned, brothers and sisters, about ilm. 
Shaitan does not want you to study. If you are not studying, then know that the shaitan has managed to get the better of you. Why do I say this? Look what Ibn al-Jawzi rahmatullahi alayhi mentioned. He died, by the way, in the year 592, that's maybe over 800 years ago. I'lam, no. Anna awwala talbisu iblisa ala nasi saddu ma'na al-ilm. The first deception of Iblis was to block you away from knowledge. This knowledge that will give you the insight of how to deal with doubts that will shake your Iman and also some of these sexual temptations that will lead you towards that direction. Shaitan doesn't want you to study. He will look for every way to block you away from knowledge. And that is because the ilm is nur, it is light. If he manages to extinguish the light, you will see yourself stumbling in the darkness. Does that make sense, my brothers and my sisters? We don't just study because I want to become the next sheikh. I want to become imam here to do the khutbas in Newbury Masjid. Huh? That's not why we study. Your salvation in this dunya is totally dependent on you taking time out to study the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also that which I want to make mention of as to why we may be struggling to read the book of Allah Azza wa Jal. Has music entered into our hearts? Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi, he mentions a very powerful line of poetry. I remember when I was younger, my mom caught me with music on my phone. We used to have the Nokia, you know, infrared. You connect to the guy's phone and then he transfers the music files. You guys remember infrared, huh? We has to hold the phone together for like 10 minutes to move one file. So I would give the phone to a classmate and throughout the hours in school, he would transfer it. And then one day my mom caught me. She said to me, oh, Muhammad, I know you want to memorize the Quran. You will not be able to do so if you are listening to music. Ah, we always think our parents are backwards. Ah. They don't have a clue of what the reality on the ground is. Years later, when I started studying, I came across this line of poetry. When he said, حُبُّ الْكِتَابِ وَحُبُّ أَلْحَانِ الْغِنَى فِي قَلْبِ عَبْدٍ لَيْسَ يَجْتَمِعَانِ The love of music and the love of the Qur'an are two things that just can't come together in one's heart. Does that make sense, brothers and sisters? I'll tell you guys about a friend that I had in Al Medina. Should I mention it later? I'll mention it now. Right? No, I'll mention it later. Huh? Mention it later. Here, brothers and sisters, you're probably thinking to yourself pornography, addicted to Netflix. This is what may be going to prevent. The ilm from entering into my heart. Is that it? This is what rushes to people's minds. The moment we speak about sins. That will prevent knowledge entering into your heart. Have you guys heard of Hafid? Nusint? This title Hafid. Does anybody know what Hafid means? Not how they use it today, Hafiz. Huh? Back in the day, if someone has the title Hafid, how many hadith does he need to memorize in order to have this title of Hafid? Huh? 100,000. 100,000 hadith. Ibn Hajar mentions about this individual. فَنَسِيَ غَالِبَ مَحْفُوظَاتِ حَتَّى الْقُرْآنِ he forgot the majority of that which he memorized and even the Qur'an. You know what the reason was? وَقِيلْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ ذَلِكَ أو إِنَّ ذَلِكَ كَانَ سَبَبًا لِوَقِيعَتِهِ فِي النَّاسِ Because he always used to rip into people. He always used to rip into people. And because of that, he forgot the majority of what he memorized. And also the Qur'an. 100,000 hadith brothers and sisters 
When I came across this statement, a lot of things began to make sense to me. I will see this brother in Al-Yemen, Wallahi. Opening the Quran, he would sit there for 10 minutes, he would close it. Go off for 20 minutes and come back. Open the Quran, sit there for 5 minutes and then leave again. Brother stayed in Al-Yemen, in the Maj for years. And he still didn't memorize the Quran. And likewise, he struggled even understanding the Arabic language. And he's just like everyone else, who's gone there to study. You know what this brother was known for? Al-Jarh wa Tajrih. He would sit around, the Sheikh is like that, the Sheikh is like this, the Sheikh is like that, the Sheikh is like this, non-stop. Makes a lot of sense now, brothers and sisters, right? Makes a lot of sense. <coughs> Whatever sin it might be, whether it is pornography addiction, adult content, uh, you struggling to stay away from your girlfriend, whoever it might be or whatever it might be. Sins have a detrimental effect in being able to acquire this nur that will be your salvation in this dunya before the hereafter. How long do I have? Wallahi, I've got another lecture in DOC. Shall I just check for me how long it'll take to get there? Or someone else, maybe he's using his phone, just check the... Tayyip. Well, I would love to spend more time with you brothers. Like I said, I feel like I'm in Darul Hijra. Huh? I feel like I'm in a Muslim country seeing all of these... Tayyip. 25 minutes together. Tayyip. The second consequence of sins. Hirman al rizq being deprived of provision, money. Did you know, my brothers and my sisters, that the sins that we carry out has a direct correlation with our financial status? What's my evidence for it? When the Messenger Sallallahu said, Inna rajula la yuhramu rizqu bi khatiyatin ya'maluha One is deprived of provision. Because of the sin that he carries out. You know the Arabs, they have a saying. You know what the saying is? الَّذِي يُصَاحِبْ يَفْقَرْ الَّذِي يُصَاحِبْ يَفْقَرْ The one who has haram relationships, he's going to become bankrupt. The one who has haram relationships, he's going to become bankrupt. There are so many different weak narrations as well. That how zina has a direct impact on your financial situation. You know, brothers and sisters, I receive a lot of messages of brothers struggling with pornography on Instagram, saying, I have this issue, I have that issue, I've become addicted. And I can just say, just about every single message that I receive of someone who's struggling with pornography, he always writes in that message. I'm struggling financially as well. Just about every message. Are you brothers and sisters with me? There was a brother that one time called me, lives in Birmingham. He said, no matter what I try, I just don't seem to be able to find a job. So I asked him, because you know, this book changes your life, changes the way you think. I asked him, how are your relationships or your relationship with your father, your mother? I just happened to ask that. But before that, I think I questioned as to whether his private life is sound or not. How's your private life? He goes, no, I'm not addicted. I don't do any of this stuff. Then how is your relationship with your parents? And this is now the answer that I was looking for in order to help him. He says, I have a very, very bad relationship with my parents. I said, why? He said, I started practicing and I came to know about raising your hands in the Salah. And this is very, very important what I'm about to say. We know that raising your hands in the Salah is Sunnah. Hadith Abdullah ibn Umar, كان نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يرفع يدي حدوا من كبير إذا ابتدع الصلاة وإذا كبر للركوع وإذا رفع رأسه من الركوع. زين بخاري مسلم. 
However, many families, they don't know that this is a sunnah. So he's learned something, he starts rubbing it in his dad's face. Right? He starts rubbing it in his dad's face. Look, this is how I pray. When his dad taught him not to raise his hands from a young age. Why don't you go and, Dad, look, I came across this. Have a nice relationship with him, a nice discussion. And because of that, they're getting into arguments. Something as small as that. They're getting into arguments. I said to him, you're 110% wrong. You start disrespecting your father and your mother because of a sunnah that you learned, which you didn't approach in the correct way when discussing with your parents. Well, like some parents, they think, the moment you start raising your hands in the salah, this is the first step to joining ISIS. Do you know that? Some parents think that. And because of that, they may react a certain way. And you as a young man should deal with it in a more smarter way, Akhi. He's arguing with his mother. He's arguing with his father. I'm like, why? The biggest right after the right of Allah is what? How you are with your parents. This is a major huge sin that you're falling into. I told him, Ittaqillah, go and kiss them on the forehead and say sorry. You think a father or a mother will reject a hadith in Sahih Bukhari? He could have easily taken the hadith book and said, Dad, look, I came across this hadith. Maybe the father will say, oh, subhanAllah, I didn't know. But he's rubbing it in his dad's face. Wallah, he calls me back two weeks later and he says, all the doors open up for me. I'm doing this now, I'm doing that, and whatever have you. I'm doing amazing financially. The sins that we carry out, brothers and sisters, has a direct impact on our financial situation. Someone may say to me, and I know probably someone's going to ask as I'm walking out, look at all of these kuffar, look at all of these drug dealers, they have the latest cars, and they have all the money. Like why hasn't the sins affected them? Is money the only type of provision that Allah Azza wa grants you? When you interview a lot of these people who have money, Something that you will find common within a lot of them is how they are so empty in their hearts. Miserable. So many issues in his life. And there's nothing more worth than being struck with an empty heart. As Malik ibn Dinar mentioned, You haven't been struck with a punishment more greater than having what? A hardened heart. I always mention this and you probably heard it before. Do you guys know Logan Paul? Huh? You guys know KSI? You guys know Justin Bieber? Have you guys heard of the Beatles? What Beatles? Are you guys saying yes? Huh? The elders know but the youngest don't. The millennials. You guys are outdated. A shahid min al-kalam, there's a brother who compiled, I think you guys know him, Smout to Jannah. He compiled small little clips of all of these very well-known famous individuals who are saying exactly the same thing. We thought the money would give us the happiness that we were looking for. However, we are on antidepressants. I have this issue, I have that issue, add food tube to it as well. Let me also read this out. I wasn't planning to talk about it, but I'll mention it. I remember sending it to a brother. Have you guys heard of Jim Carrey? Who's Jim Carrey? He's an American, Canadian, comedian slash actor. Look what he said. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of. 
So they can see that it's not the answer. Ponder, my brother and my sister, it's not all about money. It's not all about fame, that which we are chasing. That money cannot fill that void. Wallahi, you can be a drug dealer. You have all of that money. And it may well be that he cries himself to sleep. I've had rappers say that. I have rappers messaging me on Instagram, crying their eyes out. Please help me. And the guy has like hundreds and thousands, some even millions of followers. And they are Muslims. Right? So to answer that question, there's nothing more greater of a punishment than being struck with an empty heart. You may be given the money, but then that is something that money can't buy. When you بَلِّغُ الشَّاهِدُ الْغَائِبَةِ Let the one who is present convey it to the one who is absent, who needs to hear this. All of them, brothers and sisters, I remember the Beatles were saying, well, we thought it was it. Fame, money, but then we realize it's not the answer. You have Britney Spears who's crying in an interview. The interviewer is asking, what is it that you want? She goes, I just want people to leave me alone. I want the paparazzi to leave me alone. I just want to not be touched. These are some of the figures that our young women, sisters are so crazy about and listening to. What I want everyone to understand, my brothers and my sisters, especially the wealth that we use to disobey Allah Azza wa Jalla. مَا عُصِيَ اللَّهُ بِشَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَفْسَدَهُ عَلَىٰ صَحِبِهِ Never do you use something to disobey Allah Azza wa Jalla with, except Allah Azza wa Jalla will destroy that. Have you wondered sometimes, you know, we drop the phone? Or we get into a car crash? The way we are as human beings, we are ready to point the finger at everyone except ourselves. It was probably the guy who's in EE, his fault, why I dropped my phone here. Agreed? Have you guys heard of Muhammad ibn Sirin? The student of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. This righteous man who used to narrate from the likes of Abu Huraira. You know what happened to him? He was thrown into prison. You know why? Because he became bankrupt. How did he become bankrupt? He bought oil, you know, as a businessman, you would normally buy things on credit, sell it and then pay the creditor back. صح? That's how many businessmen operate. So he bought it and then all of a sudden he found a rat stuck inside of it. He bought it for a lot of money. So he had to pour everything out. Who do you think he blamed? The guy who sold him it? He could have easily blamed him, right? And that's how we are as human beings. We are ready to point the finger at everyone except ourselves. He was self-critical. When things start going wrong in your life, brothers and sisters, the first place you should be looking at is yourself. Nobody else. And I'm not saying that you just need to get punched and then you turn a cheek. No. He will be held to account for, but it could have happened because of how you conducted between yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Muhammad Zilin, when that happened to him, you know what he said? رَجُلًا قَبْلَ ثَلَاثِينَ سَنَةً I degraded an individual that I ran into over 30 years ago because of him being bankrupt. Sometimes we walk past an individual, right? I look at this guy. He goes, I degraded someone over what? 30 years ago. And because of that, I'm going through this now. Because of that, I'm going through this now. Allahu Akbar. Being self-critical. Does that make sense? He held himself to account. He took a good look at himself in the mirror. And when you do that, you will see things taking a turn for the better. As Ibn Taymi rahmatullahi alayhi and Ibn Jawzi mentioned. Ibn Jawzi commented on this qissa, this story, and he said, Wa mithlu hadha kathir. Examples like this are many. 
وما نزلت بآفة ولا هم ولا ضيق صدر إلا بزل نعرفه. Never am I afflicted by some sort of distress, anxiety, hardship, except it is because of a sin that I committed. Maybe I start making excuses for myself, and then all of a sudden I begin to see the punishment of it. Far al But when you hold yourself to account, things will take a turn for the better. Stop. Last point. On the last effect of sins. And I really want to mention it, but I don't think I'm going to find time. When your heart now, brothers and sisters, becomes so black, because every sin that you do, it has what? Places a black dot on your heart, up to the point where your heart becomes so black. And when your heart has become so black, it begins to project on your face. So much so that you could tell a sinner from a non-sinner. Especially if that individual has committed zina. The type of effect that he has on an individual's face, Wallahi, it is indeed extremely evident. Even one time there's a narration that Anas ibn Malik saw a woman outside. And he looked at her more than he should have. And then he walked into Uthman ibn Affan's house. Uthman looked at him and then dropped his head. Why is it that some people, they enter into my house and their eyes commit a zina? SubhanAllah. Wallahi, there's so many incidents I want to speak about, but I'll quickly mention this, what Abdullah ibn Abbas said, and also Hassan Basri. إِنَّ لِلْحَسَنَةِ ضِيَاءً لِلْوَجْهِ the good deed, it puts a glow on somebody's face. Agreed? When somebody goes for Umrah and he comes back, and he's glowing, he was a Vaseline. Huh? See how he's glowing? The good deed. Even when we are in Medina, a brother goes to Mecca and comes back. We'll like to see a difference. Especially when you wake up in the night. Hassan al-Basri rahmatullahi alayhi. And by the way, this is a solution to our sisters. Who wear makeup. I might say to you that makeup is haram, but I need to provide an alternative, right? It's good to provide alternatives. This is a wonderful alternative. Hassan al-Basri rahmatullahi alayhi said, ما بال رجالي أو ما بال المتهجدين بالليل من أحسن الناس وجون في النهار Why is it that those who stand up in the night, they have the nicest of faces in the day? He was asked that. He said, لِأَنَّهُمْ خَلَوْ بِالرَّحْمَانِ فَأَلْبَسَهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ نُورِهِ They secluded themselves with Allah Azza wa Jal while the people were asleep. So Allah, He covered them with His nur. So my sister, if you want nur on your face, then pray at night. Put some Vaseline on, inshallah, you'll look great. And likewise, my brothers, right? Al-Qiyam, Al-Qiyam. Brothers, I'm going to have to show off. Honestly, I want to spend more time here. Wallahi, like I said, I'm really happy to be here. Jazakumullah khair for allowing me to come to this wonderfully built masjid and this lovely area. Normally, I tell people make hijra to Birmingham or Leicester. I hear the adhan three times a day, Dhuhr, Asr, and Maghrib. My brother, good friend, Yahya, has a white revert. He walks into the area and all of the Asians, they look at him. Because everyone there is either Pakistani or Indian. That's how much, mashallah, Islam is there. Right? Right, right? And subhanAllah here, this is now something we have to add to the list of places that people could migrate to. Jazakum huh? Allah khairan wa ahsan Allah ilaykum. Honestly, it was an absolute pleasure. And I'll see you guys when I see you. Huh? For those who want to attend the lecture, the postcode is on, uh, my, on the poster on my social media. It's in somewhere, where is it? Docklands. I'll be doing another lecture on uh, the trials and something. Uh, for life. I forgot that. Uh, there's too many programs this weekend. The enemies of Islam or something along the lines of that. Inshallah ta'ala. I'll see you guys over there. Otherwise, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.